Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Little thumbs up would be great. Hopefully you can. Excellent, brilliant, welcome. So you've all drawn the uh, short straw, and you're gonna have to listen to me, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, talk about the, uh, so if I introduce myself, Gary Rogers, I'm Head of Investigations and Audit Services for the TCM Group. I obviously work with David. So unfortunately, given everything we've been discussing today, um, I deal with the end result, which is when everything's fallen apart and everything's gone seriously wrong. And we're going to talk about some of the, the, the aspects of the seven principles that came from the Baroness Dido Harding um, letter, but also from, from the uh, original independent investigation review of, uh, of obviously the tragic circumstances around Nurse Abdullah. So I suppose really, uh, first of all, let's talk about the, the independent investigation, the review. Can I just ask, let's see some hands up, because I don't want to be talking, listening to me while long, but how many of you are actually aware of, of this particular case? Just hands up, I'll do it, it's fine. Um, anyone in particular, you, you're aware of, of Nurse Abdullah and the, and the circumstances? Okay, okay, so let's, I'll, I'll give, it's great to know, so I'll give you a little bit of background on it. Essentially what happened was, and we'll discuss this, there was an investigation into originally um, it started with one allegation against nurse which is referred to as nurse sex in the report um, but it then came about that nurse abdullah was involved and the, the investigation progressed and we'll discuss some of the aspects of that investigation and what came out of this review but um, as a result um, nurse abdullah um, tragically took his own life um, before there was any investigation and outcome and so that's what led to the independent review so in that review, what, what were the, uh, the, the outcomes? What did the independent review find on this investigation? Well, first of all, as I said just now, it came from an original uh, complaint against Nurse X. As the investigation began, Nurse Abdullah was drawn in. And so the top left picture sort of shows that there was these two investigations, but actually the investigation followed one route. And then there was the, the outcome was that actually there was just so many, there wasn't enough resources. So the investigator was juggling too many balls. There was too many, you know, not enough people there. It led to delays. And there was some confusion around some of the interpretation of what was presented, what evidence was available. And if I do this, this is the key for me. What that led to was the silent enemy of any investigation. And that is assumptions were made. There were a few assumptions along the way particularly around, you know, some of the, the answers that were given at interviews and assumptions made that that then brought into question integrity and essentially this investigation went along a, a really wrong road. And it was quite critical. Um, and there were some findings. So Baroness Harding then, then wrote to all the NHS trusts and came up with the seven principles. So given that many of you or a few of you are not aware of the case, I'm, I'm assuming that you're not aware of the seven principles. So I will just cover the seven principles very, very basic, very briefly. First one was about adhering to best practice. Okay. Essentially making sure the investigation was fair and thorough. The second one was about a rigorous decision-making methodology. And that's around, you know, there were some decisions made, particularly around suspension which we'll come on to a little bit later, there were actually, it wasn't very rigorous. It wasn't very, it wasn't process driven. There was no review. And so there was, there was some, uh, some outcomes from that. And then the third one was making sure the investigator uh, um, made some assumptions as we've dis discussed at interviews, particularly around some of the answers that were given and then assuming, well, that was an indicator of, of Nurse Abdullah's, um, you know, brought into question integrity and, and actually they were lying and, and stuff like that, which, you know, if you're, if you're doing the investigation, it's clearly not, not, not what you do. Then it was assigning sufficient resources. As I said there was, a, there was just a few resources available. It led to a number of delays. And then the fifth one is around suspensions. And one of the key things was that there was a suspension made, it wasn't reviewed, it wasn't constantly risk assessed. Was the suspension necessary? Which led then to the sixth review, which is around safeguarding people's health. Um, it affected Nurse Abdullah's health, their mental health, their mental well-being, 
And that wasn't considered, it wasn't discussed, it wasn't reviewed. And then obviously there was no board level oversight. There was no senior management oversight of what was actually taking place. And so therefore it became a little bit uncontrolled. So these are just some of the seven principles. So I suppose um, the question is why are they important? And this is a very brief, because I want to open it out and open the mic out because this investigations is really key. Um, so why, why were these seven principles important? First and foremost, the action you take must be proportionate to the complaint you're receiving. And we've heard today about a triage process, and that's something we're really keen on. Actually, you need to look at what that complaint is. Do we need to go to a formal process? Is there another, there's another method of resolving the issue, which is really what we're looking at. Now, that's not always easy, and it's not always appropriate, but unless you're looking at it and you're conducting this triage, then actually, you know, how do you know it's proportionate? That the investigation is conducted fairly, thoroughly, and impartially. You know, it's really important that when you're conducting an investigation, you are impartial, you are unbiased. And obviously, I'm quite happy to talk about bias, both conscious and unconscious, particularly in investigations, and that they're conducted fairly and thoroughly. And in a timely manner. You know, there, as we've heard a lot about, you know, the, the stresses it places upon individuals, but actually the longer an investigation takes, the more stress, pressure, the more stress, the more anxiety, not only from the complainant, but the respondents, the witnesses, and all the people involved, it places pressure upon a team, particularly if it is within a team. So it's really important that it's conducted in a timely manner. And one of the key facts kind of the investigator is trained and competent, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to open it out because I know from my own experiences that I worked in a large organization for 20 years and, and generally the person doing the investigation is just another line manager that's probably not from that team, not necessarily getting all the training they need. They've got to juggle that with everything else they're doing their business as usual. But essentially, if you're conducting an investigation, you do need to be trained and confident and competent and risks are identified they're recognized you've got in place mitigation and you're constantly reviewing them it, it's a it's a hot topic and it's a topic in investigations in particular i feel certainly in my time that was never really considered and that is the stress and anxiety it places upon the individuals and you need to be aware of that and and also underlying mental health conditions you need to be really conscious that if they're displayed that you recognize those risks and you're putting in place support and advice and guidance all those things to support individuals and then progress is tracked and monitored at a senior level and now we you know when you're doing investigations i know more than better than the most that you know you're under a lot of pressure to complete them in a in a in a in a timely manner but also that sometimes unfortunately you know you're under pressure to deliver to a specific outcome actually that's not the case in terms of senior level it's just an overview of where you are so that they can be confident that the investigation is progressing i am going to say thank you this is it that's that's all i'm going to say on the matter and i'd really love it if you could just you know speak up just just talk about it because that's the important part of this session is about discussing your own experiences maybe well the, or what are the challenges you face let me throw it open what challenges do you feel you face have you been involved in investigations over to you guys <laughs> Is there anyone who wants to say anything or ask me anything at all? I think I would say that the length of time for an investigation to take place would definitely be one of our biggest challenges. And also, like you say, the, um, the experience or the, the training of the investigator, um, I would say they're probably two big things that are problems for us. So thanks. Thanks, Mike, for speaking out. And are you, so, so for example, do you find in your, in your particular area, is it that you are a manager? Are you a manager being asked to conduct an investigation? Um, so I am, I'm a staff side lead, so I'm, I'm actually a union rep. Oh. Um, so obviously I get to hear quite a lot of different things from my colleagues who, have, who are hearing, and obviously I'm, I'm quite closely linked with HR in terms of having those discussions 
that, trying to improve things. Um, myself and, and our um, deputy people director attended the course about from Mersey Care to just culture. Um, so uh, this is something we definitely wanted to work towards as a, a joint partnership type working. But these are definitely, you know, a lot of the issues that have been raised are things that we are hearing um, or, or are experiencing ourselves. Oh, my, that's thanks for that. That's great. Good, it's good to get a perspective because, so, you know, it is amazing because the one thing that's often forgotten. I, I, I'm, I'm an ex-union rep myself, Mike. So, the one thing that is forgotten actually, no one. When we're going, when when I find when they're going through this process that there is almost a perception that you know uh, uh, the representative is there to to disrupt. The proceedings when actually it is about collaborative working isn't it it's about you know being involved working together because ultimately as a manager you want to try and resolve the issue because you're investigating it you want to resolve it and as a, a representative what you're looking at is for the best outcome for your member absolutely yeah, yeah. and so this process this is why we find it's really important that's why i think um baroness harding's principles are really key because you can't have um, trust in a process if you don't have that engagement if you if it's not something you're gonna you, the journey you want to be on together you don't want to be going on different pathways like that slide where I said you're across a road where they're going in two directions you actually want it to be one direction and you're both working towards it so I think that's great anyone else want to share anything Thank you. time um, oh juggling juggling um priorities and finding time to um do the investigation to thoroughly um in a timely manner and also if there's underlying mental health which we tend to not know about or recognize and the impact that can have on on individuals absolutely Mari. That, that that's a really good point it's a good point so just to give some experience i've been involved in investigating for for giving away my age but I, just over 32 years predominantly in enforcement environment but also as a line manager i managed around 250 staff and i used to be asked to do investigations probably like yourselves and it's really challenging to set aside the time that's required to do an investigation thoroughly as well as all the other priorities that are placed on you as a line manager, you still got to manage your team and you've probably still got, you know, key performance indicators. You've still got targets to achieve. You've still got your own team to manage. And one of the things I say is that when, when you are taking on an investigation, you need to really be speaking to your line manager and really emphasizing that this is going to take you some time. And you need that time, you need that breathing space to conduct it, otherwise it's not going to get done effectively. And in the long term, whilst it is, it is challenging because you've got these priorities, but actually you need to be strong as an investigator because if, if you're not given that time, that breathing space, then it's going to be rushed. Okay, It's not going to be fair, it's not going to be thorough. And the long-term implications far outweigh the short-term challenges and, and you know, the time you need and I agree with you as well that in terms of mental health it's and I think it's in in certainly when I started in investigations it wasn't even something we considered and, and interviewing techniques were a lot a lot different then and, and certainly nothing to be proud of today but in terms of what we need to recognize is, is we should always as an investigator be looking at do I need to consult a specialist never be afraid to consult somebody, to speak to someone, to ask for support. So I think that's really key. Kirsty, you got your hand raised. Hi, hello, yes, I'm, I'm Kirsty Watmore. I'm a senior HR business partner in a mental health trust and I haven't got quite as many years experience as you, um, <laughs> Caro, but about, about 15 um, doing investigations. I suppose my observation of it is that we have made a real industry of it in the NHS about investigations. and. Um, and we often get into positions where, and this is something we've reflected on a lot in our HR team, that we'll do investigations that take four, five, 
six months to complete and at the end of it we don't really know anything new than we knew nothing more than we already knew perhaps two or three weeks after the incident had happened but we go through this rigmarole of investigating interviewing speaking to everybody in laborious detail and actually oftentimes what we know is what we already knew mm. at the start and um, we've tried um, looking at these sort of early resolution processes even uh, so this is what I'm really interested in today because you know looking at how we can sort of just support people to look at those early findings from the fact finding that we do um, and make decisions about whether anything further is actually required and making this like stopping and have, taking a breath at that point yeah. before we go any further. Um, because it's so often we take people through a process that is incredibly damaging for them as individuals and for their careers and for their colleagues and actually, you know, the outcome, um, you know, if, if it's a warning, for example, you know, it's just you've taken a long time to get there and created a lot of damage in the process. And, the, and, the, and you're so far away from the incident that actually happened that it seems almost entirely pointless. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what, Kirsty? Thank you. Because I, I'm, I'm, you know, I said my experience, it's been varied. But the one thing I've always learned, there are no winners. When you go through a no. formal process, there's no winners at all. In fact, there are just losers, which is, you know, and, and what impact does issuing a warning, for example, have on changing that person's perceptions, behaviours? None. None. Very rarely. Absolutely. And if, you know, and I'm sure we've got, we've got, obviously we've got, we've got a, a trade union representative present and, and that's my own experience. You know, ultimately, what we want to do is resolve the issue. Let's reach a mutual resolution. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to do an investigation, then, you know, and I agree with you, they're far too long. We follow far too much process. But when we're doing investigations, always consider this. I'm going to leave you because we're going to be asked to leave. But always consider this. At every point of an investigation, you should be looking to explore an opportunity to resolve it rather than a formal process. Because at that point, you can stop an investigation and say, OK, we've got agreement. Let's try and resolve it. And I think that's a key point of what today is all about. So I think that's fantastic. So thank you for that, Kirsty, because that really does fit in nicely, I think, with everything we're talking about today. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to me, and we're going to be shot off back to the main room now. But thank you.